Hi there, my name is Dr. Craig Hazel and I am the owner of Synergy Chiropractic in Kanata, Ontario. And today what we're going to be watching is we're going to be discussing the topic of ADHD. And this uh, is one of the hot topics in some of the workshops that we do in our office. And the purpose of this is so that we can give some insight and help our community understand how to how better to understand what ADHD is and also to how to support these kiddos when they're uh, after they're being diagnosed or even just helping these kiddos to have a better life experience. Uh, ADHD is both a very misunderstood diagnosis as well as an unnecessary one. And what we're going to learn tonight is really going to open up your eyes to help you to understand exactly what it is and how we can help. So one of the goals that I have tonight is really to help you to understand where does ADHD really come from. We're going to dive into understanding more about the diagnosis, but also to how uh, it has become such a widespread diagnosis, how more and more kids that we're seeing these days have been diagnosed with it. We're also going to talk about what you can do about it, and these include some things that you can do to help support these kiddos while they're at home and at school. So if you're a caregiver or a parent or a school instructor, you can uh, learn a lot from this and really help to understand more about how these kids' brains work, and then also to how you can help to support them. But the other thing I want to dive into is how does the nervous system fit in? And as a chiropractor, we're going to dive into uh, the role in which a chiropractic care can really help these kids. And it seems uh, at a glance something that's, uh, you know, you think of chiropractic, you think of back pain and neck pain and headaches. And yes, you'd be right. But one of the things that we do in our office is different from traditional types of chiropractic care in that we are heavily focused on pediatric and family wellness care. So we're going to understand better how the nervous system can help these kiddos with their ADHD. So first off, who am I? Well, Dr. Craig Hazel, and uh, like I said, we have a very specific focus in pediatric chiropractic. And one of the things that uh, started me on this path and on this journey was really understanding and seeing firsthand how children with autism and sensory deficit disorder, uh, sensory processing disorders, attention deficit, uh, autism, uh, asthma, all those sorts of, of really challenging uh, situations, how they improved under chiropractic care. And as you know, the, the definition of doctor is teacher. And so my purpose is really to help people to understand more. So I'm going to teach as much as I'm going to heal, and, and I really want patients to understand uh, more about how they can help themselves. So, as I said, we, uh, we, one of the big things that we do is focusing on pediatrics and, and family wellness and pregnancy. It is a specialization within the chiropractic profession. Uh, my certifications have come as postgraduate work, and we have over 250 hours of postgraduate training that... Uh, uh, allows me to work on and care for children of all ages. But we also, like I said, we, we not only think of chiropractic as for back pain and neck pain, but we also care for everything from bedwetting, seizures, constipation, ear infections, learning behavioral issues, uh, sensory integration disorder, headaches, and so much more. And it's going to make more sense as we go through this. So in this uh, you can see on the screen there, these are my two kiddos, and these two kids have an abundant level of health, and uh, it's something that my wife and I have purposely done from the time that they have been born. Our goal and our mission is to help them live an extraordinary life, and the purpose uh, of why I'm doing this is because I really believe that all of the kids in this community have the same potential to live an outrageous level of health like these two kids do. They eat healthy, they get adjusted, they've been adjusted since birth. You know, we have a very um, strict discipline when it comes to our health, and uh, the results show for themselves. So let's talk a little bit more about what is ADHD. And as the, the acronym uh, you can see there, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And I honestly don't believe that it is a deficit or a disorder. And... Uh, a lot of health professionals would agree with that statement because what we notice is that ADHD is more of a trait than a deficit and more of, and uh, even more so it's less of a disorder. And so 
in these kids' brains, we actually believe that these children are extremely intelligent. You know, some of the greatest minds in history, Einstein, Steve Jobs, Kurt Cobain, some of the people that have really transformed the culture of our world, all were diagnosed with ADHD. And so how we look at it is it's a Ferrari engine with bicycle brakes. They have a very powerful, strong, creative, intelligent mind, but their challenge is that when they get into situation that requ uh, situations that require them to slow down or make a turn, they don't have the ability to break uh, that engine. And so as a result, they get themselves into a whole host of, of challenges. And so when we go through this, um, we understand that ADHD really has two components to it. And the first one is what we would refer to as sympathetic overdrive. And sympathetic, if you remember back from, uh, from physiology in high school, is your fight or flight system. Your fight or flight system in, in these kids is really turned on overdrive. And what happens is they can't slow it down. And if you remember, your sympathetic fight or flight is really designed for survival and its main purpose is to get you out of challenge or out of trouble. It's the part of your nervous system that revs you up. The second part of ADHD is a poorly organized nervous system. And what this means is that it, these kids are unable to be able to perceive their environment appropriately, make the necessary response, and then uh, the behavior that comes out is simply an, an error message that is as a result of an inability to properly um, process and integrate what they've received from their receptors, which is through their sensory system. So, and both of these must be addressed and in that order, because if the sympathetic nervous system is not uh, dealt with and it continues to be on overdrive, well, the nervous system is going to continue to be poorly organized, and these kids are going to have a very difficult time trying to get their uh, themselves to calm down and get themselves to focus. So, when we talk about that sympathetic overdrive, we're going to dive in a little bit deeper here. If you think of uh, the sympathetic nervous system, you can see a kind of referred to it as the gas pedal model, and then the parasympathetics, well, that's your slow down side, that's your brake pedal. And so, as I said, the sympathetic nervous system is really designed for your fight or flight. If you're down by the water and you're having a beautiful morning and out jumps a bear, your sympathetic nervous system kicks into gear. You gotta either fight that bear or you've gotta try and run for safety. Its main purpose is that it's only there for short periods. It's only there to help get you out of trouble. Your parasympathetics, well, this is where the magic happens and this is where kids are supposed to be. You can see that the primary function of the parasympathetic is to rebuild, it's to grow, to, to develop, and the immune system is uh, most optimal in this parasympathetic mode, as well as the digestive system and the endocrine system, which is your hormone system. And so what happens is these kiddos get stuck in the gas pedal mode. They can't slow themselves down and they can't pump those brakes. And so they end up getting into a state where growth and development just doesn't happen. They're really trying to get through uh, just that fight or flight moment. And if you think of that bear situation, when you're in a sympathetic fight or flight, your nervous system is going to become hypervigilant. Your eyes widen, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up. And the intention of that is because you're trying to look for danger. You're trying to understand primitively and, and reflexively how you can protect yourself. And so if you're parasympathetic, let's say that you've escaped the bear, you've found safety, that's the part that slows you back down. It slows your heart rate down, it slows your blood pressure down, and allows you to stay in a calm state. If you're in a sympathetic state, your body's going to become, like I said, hypervigilant, you're on edge, you're anxious, you're inability to focus because you're looking for exit points to get to safety. Your parasympathetic or your brake pedal, well that's where you're going to be able to uh, start to heal, start to function, and you're going to be able to do things uh, in a smarter way. You can imagine if you're encountering a bear, the last thing that you're going to think about is how to do long division properly. It's in that parasympathetic state where you can do your best work and stay uh, your best as far as your focus goes. And so, uh, 
as we said, that ADHD is really uh, simply a state of excessive sympathetic activity. Um, this is by far the most common component that we see with ADHD kiddos. And you know, the hallmarks of ADHD are hyperactivity, impulsiveness, and behavioral issues. And so this little graphic here is going to help us to understand why that happens. In our office, we utilize technology that has been used on uh, three different space missions. And we don't kid around with this stuff. We invested in the best technology that's available to us so that we can understand better how the nervous system functions. We're able to measure how well the nervous system is perceiving its environment, how well the nervous system is transmitting those messages that come from the brain down the spinal cord, to all of the five senses as well as the other two senses which we're going to talk about which is going to be things like your balance and coordination. If you notice on uh, the screen here, and I'll move my mouse over, you can see this white teardrop that is watermarked inside. You notice these black lines, how they zigzag in and out and don't follow that same teardrop pattern. When we look over here, this is the pattern that I'm referring to. So the pattern score here is a relative number that is comparing those black lines relative to that watermark. That symmetry, you can see things don't look all that balanced, right? So that symmetry, we want that number to be as close to 100 as possible. And in this kiddo's case, this is the big one that we look at, that total energy. This test is done when the child is sitting in a very calm, seated position. This test result would tell us that this child is expending 394 um, units of total energy. Essentially, that's 294% more energy needed just to sit. And to help you to make sense of this, their nervous system is hyperactive. It is extremely overactive. And what that does is that as they're trying to sit still in class, um, their nervous system is, is fidgety. They're going to have challenges with anxiety. They're going to have challenges with their sensory systems because think of it as Metallica playing in your ear while you're sitting there listening and trying to understand what the teacher is telling you or for that matter what your parent is telling you. And so with these kiddos, they're unable to continue to stay focused because their nervous system is being hyper barraged with so much stimulation. And it's really hard for them to, to focus because it's coming out like a fire hose. They can't take it in small segments, process it, integrate it, and respond appropriately. And so what we're seeing is that the output or the behavior in this case comes out as something that is, um, we'll say, less than desirable, right? Because ADHD, we're hoping to help these kids with their ability to focus less hyper, less uh, uh, behavioral issues. And so the problem is a situation of garbage in versus garbage out. If their nervous system is perceiving things improperly, well, in kind, their nervous system is going to respond improperly. That improper response is, again, what we call ADHD. And in that matter, it can be um, anything. And this is also true in cases of autism, in sensory integration processing challenges, um, and a whole host of other problems. And so the second component that we talked about is that poorly organized nervous system. And so to dive into that a little bit deeper, what we understand is that the role of the nervous system is to perceive the environment coordinate the behavior of all the other cells. So as I said, you're supposed to receive a message properly, coordinate the response, and then make the appropriate um, output. The challenge is that with these kids, they, they don't get the right input. So the output becomes wrong. These kids are spinning so fast that they, they simply can't slow themselves down. And so they start having challenges socially, academically, behaviorally, physically, and through speech. Socially, they blurt out things that, uh, you know, typically you would say. They, they, they could almost say that they don't have a filter. Academically, they have a really hard time reading what's on the page. They have a hard time focusing on what the teacher is instructing them to do and following a sequence of uh, 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 steps in, in order to complete the task. 
behaviorally, they just blurt out stuff without even thinking about, like I said, it's almost like a lack of, of uh, filter, but then they have an impulsiveness to see what that sound is in the corner of the room. They have an impulsiveness to uh, investigate things because it they just can't let it go. It's almost like a, 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 a challenge with their ability to um, put it out of their mind. They have to find out what the issue is. Physically, they fidget. One of the classic signs of ADHD is kids that fidget. You'll see them in what are referred to in neurology as overflow movements. They may stick a tongue out while they're coloring or while they're writing. They may have to shake a leg or fidget with their foot. They're constantly moving. They can't sit still. And then speech-wise, they may have challenges uh, with language, and that is a pretty classic early sign of uh, a sensory challenge. So <clears throat> again, here's another graphic of that same kiddo in our office that uh, we talked about, and you can see that we've got a really poor pattern. You can see that that symmetry has improved from our last scan, but more importantly, that total energy has really dropped down dramatically. And so that's a huge uh, benefit to this child. And again, what we started to see is easier and better function within the classroom. And so <clears throat> how does your spine fit into all this? I mean, as a chiropractor, like I said, you think of back pain, neck pain. Well, let's talk a little bit about that because we talked about the nervous system. We talked about the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And really that your spine is more than just the bones, the muscles, and the ligaments. Those are all the outer components of the body. But on the inside, that delicate nervous system lives inside of those bones that is uh, protected by the bones, moved by the muscles and held together. Uh, those bones are held together by those ligaments. It's that nervous system on the inside that we are working with. It's not the bones, it's not the muscles, it's simply the nervous system that controls and coordinates and regulates all of the actions within the body. And so as we talk about the principles of chiropractic is that we understand that the body is made to heal and meant to be well, not sick. What I mean by that is if you cut your finger, the body heals it, not the band-aid. When you were born, your body knew how to take breast milk from a mother and be able to turn it into the cells of your eye. You didn't have to read a book. You didn't have to understand anything. Your body knew how to make those cells. And so what we understand is that your body is designed to be healthy and to be well. The nervous system is what's controlling and coordinating everything in that body. But it's the interference in the process that the nervous system is no longer able to regulate, coordinate, restore, and maintain the proper integrity of that, that body. And so this interference, or what we refer to as the subluxation, is what causes the dysfunction in the nervous system. So <clears throat> when we talk about the sub subluxation, I want you to understand a little bit more. There's really three main components to it. The first one is, is the simplest to understand, and that is that when the joint becomes misaligned or fixated, it's losing its ability to move through its proper range of motion. So you see that rusted old hinge that I've got as a picture there? That's a really good um, description of what happens. You can understand that if that is not moving smoothly, the door is not hung and structurally uh, it has shifted, well that's going to start to create an abnormal movement in that hinge. You see that yellow bone in the picture on the right hand side? That is the top vertebrae in the spine. That is the atlas vertebrae and its job is to house and protect an that brain stem in pink, but it's also the main bone in the, in the neck that allows that, per, that person, that child, to be able to turn their head, lift their head, bend to the sides. And you can see in that misaligned position, it starts to put impinging stress on that brain stem and also, too, into uh, the blood vessels that control and coordinate uh, blood flow to the head and neck. In that aligned position, the spinal cord is relaxed. There's little to no stress we're able to get that signal through. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the third component is the most crucial and the troublesome, and that's really the neurological imbalance. So the dyskinesia is that abnormal alignment and fixation. What happens next is that we get a process called disafferentation. What that means is just like we talked about, 
is that sensorily they cannot perceive their environment properly. So all of the messages that are coming in from their sight, sound, taste, smell, and touch, but then also to their receptors within their joints and their skin, you're getting the wrong messages received by the brain. What this does is the body perceives a state of stress because it's no longer uh, in that calm state. It's in that metallica state where there's a lot of, of interference. There's a lot of noise coming into the system. What that does is it puts the body into that sympathetic overdrive, which is that dysautonomia. And then the result is we get that abnormal energy output and control, which is that disorganized nervous system. Okay. Um, like a windmill, when it turns, it's creating electrical uh, current, and your brain is, is quite the same. 60% of the nerves that pick up uh, this movement or this brain food um, through movement live in the spine. So when your spine is not moving properly, you're not getting the proper brain food back to the brain, and the result is we start getting that dyskinesia, we start getting the disaffrontation, and we start going through the cascade. Uh, incidentally, 33% of the nerves that pick up this movement live in the upper neck, and that's one of the most commonly subluxated places in the spine. Um, and the reason why is uh, it's so often subluxated is, is honestly through the birth process, and then through some of the other activities that go on in a child's young life. We're going to talk more about that here in a second. Um, movement is life, and if the nervous system is not perceiving and getting those uh, that movement, then we start having challenges, and then the problems start happening. So what does the uh, chiropractic adjustment do? Well, its purpose is to restore that alignment and that movement, and that's the... Uh, increases that incoming flow of the proprioception or the movement in the brain. That you basically clear the pathway, allowing those proper messages to be received. You turn down the volume on Metallica. You allow the nervous system to perceive its environment appropriately. That balances out the nervous system, calming down the sympathetics, pumping those brake pedals so that your parasympathetics can kick in, thereby restoring the balance and restoring that energy output and organization to normal levels. So how do we know if, the, if your child has these subluxations? Well, like I said, we use the same technology um, that they use to scan astronauts. And, and this technology has, uses absolutely no radiation. It's no pain. It doesn't put anything into the body. It doesn't take anything out. It doesn't put any charge in. We use it to, mostly on kids and babies in our office, but we also uh, tend to use it on, on adults as well. So as I said, we we're talking about the subluxation, and the first thing that we wanted to understand was, well, how does the subluxation even happen in the first place? So one of the number one ways that it happens is through birth trauma. And almost all of the neurodevelopmental cases that we see can be traced back to birth. And that's one of the reasons why we ask such detailed questions in the health history so that we can understand exactly how that birth process happened. Um, nearly half of the births in this country, in Canada, are C-sections. And in this case, the baby's head and neck are often used as leverage. That atlas bone is used as a fulcrum to pull on that child during the birth process. Now, as that child's coming through the vaginal canal, they have to wiggle themselves down and through. And um, oftentimes, even in, the, in those cases, an obst obstetrician will use anywhere from 60 to 90 pounds of pressure uh, when they pull on that spine. And this is uh, known statistics in obstetrics. Uh, most of the interventions that are used, like Pitocin, is designed to actually create a more forceful contraction of the uterus. That uterus can contract as much as 10 to 15 times harder than it would naturally. So that puts a lot of stress on that child. And you know that space is a premium in month nine in that, in that uh, uterus and in the womb. And so that stress alone can put that child is all folded up and, and stuffed inside there um, that child's spine can suffer quite a bit of stress, even, 
even without any pulling yet, like just from the, the in, what we call in utero constraint. Then you add in something like an epidural where mom in, is no longer able to feel, so there, that magic dance of mom being able to work with baby, they're almost numb from the, the waist down, so they really don't feel much. What this has been shown is to have uh, proven increased stress on the child. Now, like I said, um, a German doctor, uh, a medical doctor, found that even through a normal vaginal birth, spinal injury was present in 80% of the 1,000 infants he examined shortly after birth. This is what his words, causing interference to the neurological and immune system function. Uh, or what we would refer to as the subluxation. He concluded that all of the upper cervical spines of all infants should be checked and adjusted, if necessary, by a chiropractor before they even leave the hospital. And this is a medical doctor. Um, one of the other things that we note is that, as I mentioned, that upper bone in the neck, which is that atlas bone, it fully surrounds the brainstem, and the brainstem is close, close proximity to that cerebellar, um, the cerebellum, which is your ability to properly perceive your, your world. Cerebellar injury, other than cerebellar injury at birth, having an autistic identical twin is the only better predictor of the diagnosis of autism. So not only does birth trauma affect the brain and its cortical function and hyperactivity and attention issues, it can also extend in all the other sensory processing challenges. And I'm going to argue that uh, ADHD really is one of the sensory processing uh, disorders because, again, like I said, you, your body just can't perceive the environment properly. So another, uh, I continue, the Dr. Gutman had said that the trauma from the birth process remains a very under-publicized and therefore under-treated problem. So where does it start? Like I said, it comes from the birth process. And the World Health Organization right now says that there really shouldn't be any reason why our C-section rates are over 10% at the most. Um, you see there down at Delnor, but really down at the Queensway Carlton, I've heard numbers as high as 46 to 48% of births are through um, C-sections. Amazing. Now, I'm going to show you this video and it's not for the faint of heart because it is showing some of the physical forces that are being applied. I've actually shown this video to obstetricians as well as uh, pediatric nurses and they will tell me that this is a very typical and routine um, type of phenomenon that happens. So if you're a little squeamish, he's using a vacuum on top of the head. What happens is when the baby comes through the vaginal canal, like I said, they almost have to wiggle their way down and through. You can see them leveraging against the top part of the head, creating sub, uh, subluxation, creating suboccipital strain in the upper cervical spine. Now, You can hear him even making reference to uh, the head being the problem, right? Um, in that scope, like as we were saying, the baby is it's coming down through the vaginal canal. It almost has to wiggle its way through. Um, during a C-section, there's almost a vacuum effect that's created because as they make the incision and they have to go in, usually the child is head down, but sometimes in a breech position. Um, so the head may be up or to the side. But when they pull through the abdomen, as it's wrapped around the head, you can see that they have to pull with the vacuum because it's almost a vacuum effect of suction around that child's spine. And so uh, I have never yet seen a C-section birth uh, child that doesn't have at least a mild upper cervical subluxation. These subluxations, like I said, can be present even prior to birth, uh, especially if there's a breech presentation or that in utero constraint. Um, you see here baby Zoe, she had a complete natural water birth, um, very uncomplicated vaginal birth, but even in her situation of force coming through the birth canal, she even uh, uh, had subluxation in her upper cervical spine. 
So other common ingredients that create the subluxation can be things like a lack of proper exercise. So while the nervous system uh, and, and the chiropractic adjustments are a very specific type of movement, exercise itself, physical movement, is more of a global uh, adjustment. So on average, kids in Canada are only spending about four to seven minutes of their day playing outside. Um, even fewer, uh, creating less of the activities, less organized sport, more just fun play, um, <clears throat> you know, playing at the playground, building forts, climbing trees, kicking balls. Those are all ways in which you can get the kids moving and get them playing and doing things. Neural integration exercises and therapy. So really sensory play. As we talked about that Metallica situation where they're, they're unable to properly perceive their environment, Sensory integration exercises allow them to receive the right types of messages through movement, through using their touch, taste, uh, smell, um, and sight. Um, what it does is it helps to take care of the poor organization and sensory processing integration challenges. So things like an occupational therapist will give them exercises where they may be doing things on a balance ball, learning to do some cross-crawl exercises, having them do some... Um, tactile touch type work with fuzzy, smooth, uh, rough, etc. type of, of objects. Um, and we all agreed, no matter what discipline of healthcare we come from, is that ADHD really is more of a sensory processing. These kids are just, like I said, poor organization, poor integration, poor ability to to properly perceive their environment. And so when we add it all up, one plus one equals 11. They just simply cannot, uh, again, properly perceive. So it becomes an exaggerated type of input to their nervous systems and their bodies. Another common ingredient is the nutritional environmental toxins. This is a, a, a big one that most people work to start with. They try to clean up the child's diet. You've heard of it before. Sugar is the... Uh, uh, the thing that you want to try and pull out of their diet. Um, you know, the typical Canadian diet uh, of a child is, is quite awful. As a baby, you've heard breast is best. Uh, breast milk is really going to be dependent on the diet of the mother. If mom's eating a really um, crummy diet, then that child's br uh, breast milk that they're getting is going to be crummy as well. If you make a switch to something like formula, you'll read in those first two ingredients on any formula package is that uh, high fructose glu uh, corn syrup is one of the most commonly added first ingredients. So it's mostly sugar. Um, in a young growing infant, we don't want to be giving them sugar. We want to be giving them the best of the best that we possibly can. As a child, oftentimes the pediatrician will refer them to start eating things like cow's milk, including things like rice cereals and then moving to baby's first foods, which are things like Cheerios, goldfish. I really wish they'd take goldfish off the market. Those things are loaded with grains. They're loaded with uh, unbleached, or sorry, bleached flour, uh, tons of colorants, tons of additives and preservatives. Um, and again, what these do is they are excitotoxins. They cause the nervous system to become overcharged and overexcited. So, Wait a second, you said don't drink milk? I thought everybody's supposed to drink milk. Well, one of the big challenges in milk is that the big protein that's found in cow's milk is really hard to digest. Now, casein is actually about 40 times the size of the protein that is found in breast milk. This casein protein is perceived by the human body as a foreign protein and what the nervous system and the immune system will do is they can start to create a hypersensitivity reaction to it. Large, large number of allergies can be traced back to an inability to properly um, work with the immune system. It, it simply becomes hypersensitive. Our milk that we have now, unless you get it from a farmer, is highly pasteurized and homogenized. And the reason why is because most of the cows are stuffed into pens where they're up to their, um, you know, they're up to their knees and up to their bellies in um, their own feces, their own, um, you know, 
poor sanitation, their straw and their hay that gets all over their udders so that starts to create bacteria and viruses that pass from one cow to the next. So then they're given uh, antibiotics for the bacteria that's on their udders. That bacteria gets into, or sorry, that antibiotics get into the milk. And then we start getting uh, bacteria in the milk um, as well. And that needs to be heated up to be killed off. So on and so on. So the milk that we get is a really poor quality one. Okay, so like I said, what about the grains? It's also, it's oftentimes the thing that we are told to give them uh, first. Grains really become sugar um, when they are digested by the human body. It's broken down into the micronutrients of uh, elements that has an effect on blood sugar levels the same way that sugar does. And when your nervous system uh, perceives that your insulin is rising because you have so much sugar in your bloodstream, that drives your sympathetic nervous system, which again, overcharges the sympathetics. So <clears throat> as we've talked about, things that we put into the body are absolutely essential. And uh, one of the staggering studies that was done um, almost 12 years ago is that they analyzed umbilical cord blood. And what the scientists in this uh, study found is that they tested for 400 specific chemicals and they found 287 of them in um, the kids that they examined. So 180 of those were known carcinogens. So everything from uh, plastics to pollutants with from air quality, from... So mom will have encountered a lot of these pollutants and toxins, and then those were passed through the blood and into the child. 217 of those chemicals were found to be toxic to the brain and nervous system, and 207 of them have been known to cause birth defects. In the study, they actually said that they would have found more, but they only tested for 400. Kids are deficient. With all of us, there are certain things that we, we require for health. Movement is one of them, but your kids also need to get omega-3 fatty acids. This is the absolute backbone for all of neurological health. It is important for everything from heart health to digestion to immune system. Omega-3 fatty acids is what creates healthy cells. We got to get them from our diet. We just don't get them in sufficient quantities from the foods that we eat. You can eat lots and lots of, uh, of omega-3 fish but the problem is you're also getting a lot of the pollutants and the toxins, the heavy metals, etc. Um, we need to get plants. We need to make, uh, you think of, of plants, it needs certain things. And if you don't give it what it needs, if you're giving it sunlight and good soil but not enough water, well, you're going to start to create a lot of problems. Kids are really dehydrated. They're given juice. They're given sugary drinks instead of just plain old water. And the result is we're seeing more and more kids that are dehydrated. And when a child is dehydrated, that can also affect their ability to focus. Their immune systems are the resulting sufferer. And um, when your immune system is down, your nervous system goes into a sympathetic fight or flight state. Conversely, or uh, and similarly, the sympathetic overload of your nervous system also weakens the immune system. With these kids, and they had a history of, <clears throat> when they have a history of, uh, uh, of immune challenges, that's usually the precursor to what we start seeing as becoming ADHD later on. So oftentimes we'll see a history of ear infections, sinus infections, frequent colds, asthma, allergies, and so much more. And it unfortunately gets perpetuated because antibiotics further weaken the immune system by um, really destroying the gut flora. 70 to 80 percent of your immune system lives in your gut. Why? Because that's where the majority of the things entering into your body come through. It is the root of transmission of most viruses and bacteriums um, because you're ingesting food that may have come in contact with some of those. What about electronic toxicity? Well, Sadly, most of our kids are glued to their electronics, and this includes video games, iPods, iPhones, computers. These things are super convenient and they're um, you know, super entertaining, but they don't involve any creativity or imagination. They don't get proper stimulation through their cerebellum and through their sensory systems other than visually and auditorily. So um, 
these kids with the Ferrari brains, you can see like they'll sit in front of a video game for hours and hours and hours and play without even stopping. But unfortunately, what it's doing is it's giving their nervous systems a ton of stimulation without the movement and without much of a response. It's really just pipelined right into their cortex and it bypasses that very important cerebellum where they've got to get that motion and movement to coordinate a response. They're really just being lulled to sleep by the stimulation. And so <clears throat> when the nervous system is revved really high because of that, their nervous system starts running at a really high level and, and a um, high frequency. Um, like I said, creativity, imagination, organization essentially go dormant. And, uh, you know, you're seeing more and more of infants starting to use iPads and, and more and more kids are getting hooked onto these things. So I've talked a lot about a lot of things tonight, but what I wanted to do is really kind of uh, reiterate what we've talked about and sum it up. ADHD, like I said, has two components. It's that first, that sympathetic overdrive where their nervous system is in that fight or flight state. And the second thing is that they have a disorganization to that nervous system. They can't properly perceive and coordinate. And you've heard me say that a number of times. Your nervous system lives inside your spine and the spine is that middleman. It's the brain body connection. It houses and protects that nervous system. And if it's not being uh, able to properly perceive uh, the messages coming in through that interference or the subluxation, doesn't it make sense to get that checked out? Doesn't it make sense to make sure that that brain-body connection is connected? Um, you know, if we could find that one subluxation that's creating the ADHD and we address that, should we leave the rest of them closed off or should we open them all up as well? And I think the answer to that is really, we want to make sure that these kids are getting the absolute best growth development neurological function that they possibly can. You know, we always uh, say in chiropractic, if your spine was on your face, you would do a way better job of taking care of it because you'd be able to see the problems firsthand. So people often ask me, Dr. Craig, what would you do if your child had ADHD? Well, the absolute first thing I would do is take them to a pediatric chiropractor different from traditional chiropractic in that our focus is on pediatrics, but more importantly, it's getting to the root cause of it. Rather than just trying to treat, you know, the typical traditional chiropractic um, practice, which is pain, inflammation, and, and discomfort, uh, we are focusing on a so much higher level of neurological organization and function. So, I would make sure that my child was evaluated by a pediatric chiropractor using the technology, using the scan technology to understand and to be able to guide the child's care in the right direction. On an ongoing basis, those scans are performed again so that we can see progress. We can make the necessary changes to the care plan and to the child's care so that they're always getting the absolute best and we're getting the subluxation under control. I would also start to incorporate neural integration exercises and therapy. And because of uh, the specialization of these types, I have a fantastic occupational therapist that I refer to. Uh, <clears throat> she's local. She's just around the corner from our office. And she's absolutely wonderful with children. Her focus is on pediatrics. So I want the best of the best for my patients. And that's who I would refer to. So Heather Hodgins Chan, you can see her number there and her website. Check her out. Unbelievable. The next thing is, yes, I would clean up the diet and the environment. I would start adding in the things that a child needs and requires to be healthy. I would start adding fruit. I would be getting rid of the chemicals that uh, are so often laden in their diet. And I would be getting things um, like omega-3 fatty acids and probiotics and vitamin D. Um, I also, you would recommend, and, and we do utilize uh, essential oils because they have been shown to be helpful in calming the nervous system, whether it be lavender or some of the other essential oils that can be fantastic in, in stimulating that, uh, that you know, olfactory or that sensory part of the nervous system. As I said, supplementation is going to be a must Kids are on a crummy diet. They have been. We're making a transition. We're doing the best we can. It's not going to happen overnight. I would make sure they're getting all of those vitamins and minerals that they possibly can through a multivitamin until you start making that transition to a real whole food-based diet. Fish oil is going to be an absolute must. 
Kids need about 2,500 milligrams a day, 2.5 grams a day. Um, probiotics, easily you're going to need um, a good, I would say, 10 to 15 billion units a day. Vitamin D, kids can get uh, 2,500 IUs per day. You'll hear that Health Canada will recommend four to 800 IUs per day for a child or an adult. That is the absolute bare minimum recommended daily intake that is going to be required to avoid things like rickets and other uh, malnutrition diseases. We're talking about optimal. We want these kids to get the very best. There's not going to be a toxicity with vitamin D. The research is very detailed and very expansive on this. you got to get them the right amount, and 2,500 units is the right amount. Antioxidants, we got to neutralize some of those chemicals that have come in over the years. As those old, tired cells in their bodies wear out and uh, get replaced by new cells, we want those new cells to be vibrant. We want to have abundant energy, and we want them to have the best ox antioxidant uh, ability. Antioxidants are really going to come from a lot of the fruits and vegetables that they're eating. So make sure they're getting lots of that. Play. We've got to get these kids moving. We, You're going to notice that when you get them into activities where they're using their whole body, not just you know like a golf club, um, but they're using their whole bodies, they're going to do so much better and they're going to perform better because they're giving that brain that stimulation that they need. So I would make it, you know, uh, figure out ways that after school you head to the park and you play for an hour. Uh, to support the child in school, teachers and caregivers can also uh, give them time to be able to do tasks that involve movement. You're seeing more and more teachers utilizing uh, exercise balls in the class or uh, little... Uh, uh, inflated discs that the kids can sit on so that they're getting a little bit of stimulation and movement. Um, we're starting to see more and more standing desks even in the school system. It's really cool like we're starting to see more and more of this science trickling down to the educational and the occupational uh, workforces. Unplug. Let's get them off the TV. Let's get them off of the stimulation of those games. Absolutely not before school, before a task where they've got to do homework, etc. We got to wind them down. We don't want to wind them up and uh, we want to make sure that we're limiting how much of those electronics they're getting. As we've talked about to, through this presentation, um, those nerves that fire together wire together. When those nervous uh, nerves are getting those improper messages um, the nerves that fire together wire, wire together. So those patterns and compensations can be developed over time. The cool part is when we start doing the right things, nerves that fire together wire together. That nervous system can be untrained and retrained to a higher level. That's the beauty of it. So it's going to take a while to get things under the under control, we got to make sure that there's no interference. We got to make sure that we're getting all the things that they need, those ingredients, and we got to stick with it because that's going to give the kids the best opportunity to get through the challenge of ADHD, to learn how to get their bodies functioning the very, very best that they possibly can. So, you know what? I'm glad that you've been able to, uh, to join us on this presentation. Um, you know what? As a pediatric chiropractor, if you are in our area and we can help, you know what, give us a call. Check out our website. So our phone number is 613-591-9151. Our website is, again, www.SynergyChiropracticCanada.com. Um, you can even just look up Synergy Canada and Google that. Um, but join our tribe. I mean, we really want to make sure that these kids have the most extraordinary lives they possibly can. If you're viewing this and you're not in our area, don't fret. We have been able to find chiropractors for people all around the world. The network of pediatric chiropractors is wide and deep. We are able to find people in even some of the most remote corners of, uh, of the nation and as well as uh, I've found chiropractors overseas for people. Um, we have a very tight-knit group of chiropractic uh, pediatric docs that are looking to help these kiddos out. So don't hesitate. Contact me directly through the website and I'll be able to help you find somebody that's going to be able to help. Okay. 
we like I said, we we truly want to see these kids have such a level of health um, that they were designed to, that their potential has is is starting them off with. And each and every one of these kiddos in this picture has a story. Each and every one of these kiddos has overcome a challenge that they've had. And uh, every one of these kids just has such a, a vibrant, extraordinary health expression as a result of it at this point. Okay, so again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me through the website on any of the things that we've talked about, and uh, we'll be absolutely sure to help. Okay, so again, this is Dr. Craig Hazel from Synergy Chiropractic in Canada, Ontario. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching this. Please share. Please pass it on to your friends and your family. And uh, again, if we can be of any help, we'd be happy to.